everyone. Thank you for coming. It's uh, delightful for me to see you all here for this uh, event. My name is Patrick Mason. I'm the dean of the, dean of the School of Arts and Humanities here at Claremont Graduate University. Uh, and it's really my pleasure to, to welcome you here tonight uh, for the 16th annual Pat Reef Lecture. Uh, one of the things that we talk about here at Claremont Graduate University is that we do research that matters. And especially in this day and age, I can't think of research that would matter much more than the research and teaching that is done under the auspices of our Women's Studies and Religion program. And uh, the Pat Reef Lecture for, uh, for 16 years now, for more than a decade and a half, has been a, a pillar of, of that program and part of, our, uh, part of our offerings, not only to our students and to our university community, uh, but also to the broader community, and, and that's why I'm so glad to have so many of our friends from around the community here. Uh, we have many of our faculty, many of our students, and, and friends from around the, the consortium and Claremont School of Theology and, and from various constituencies, and we're just very pleased you're here. I do want to note, uh, tonight uh, we're, we're joined by uh, Karen Torgerson, uh, who was one of the inaugurators of all of this. <laughs> we're joined with, uh, by members of the Pat Reef uh, Committee, uh, who put this together every year, so thank you for being here. And of course, uh, most importantly, we're, we're joined tonight by Dr. Kwok Puilan. Uh, we're very grateful to have you here. Uh, but again, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Uh, this is one of the signature events that we do every year within the Department of Religion, uh, and I, I think we're all in for a treat. So without further ado, I want to introduce my colleague, Dr. Nicola Denzi lewis who's the chair of the Religion Department and also holds the Margot Goldsmith Chair of Women's Studies and Religion, a terrific colleague and teacher and scholar uh, who will introduce the rest of the evening's program. Thank you, Patrick. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm so happy to see so many people here and to see so many familiar faces and so many new faces. So this is really terrific. Um, what I'm going to do first is, uh, is introduce what we've got next before we actually get to our speaker. So um, many of you might have this question, who is Pat Reef? It's a very good question. Um, and why do we have a lecture uh, in her name? here at CGU. What's the connection? Well, if you've been to the Pat Reef Lecture in prior years, you might see we actually start with a short film uh, that introduces Pat Reef so that everybody can know. And let us say that the film last year um, was, um, was, was starting to need a little bit of updating with more recent speakers and more, you know, um, changes and so on. So uh, we have worked very hard, particularly to point out Joy and Janice uh, here. Where's Joy's over there taking pictures? And Joy and to Janice Foster, who have worked and labored all summer and into the fall to make a new film for CGU with our uh, CGU videographer Anthony Penta that will introduce you to who Patrick was and why we do this lecture. So. Without further ado, we'll start. Roll film. My friend Pat Reef was a nun, as I was. She went to St. Louis University, and she also did some work at Oxford. And that's because she was also going to be teaching at Immaculate Heart College. Here at home, a group of nuns decided recently that they would break with the Vatican altogether, but would continue much of the work they had been doing. ABC's Dick Shoemaker has a report from Los Angeles. The 500 sisters own and operate a Catholic girls' college near Hollywood and Vine. In 1967, the sisters started a minor rebellion. They decided it was time to discard the traditional black habit. It was time, they said, to set their own lifestyles, to pray and work where and when they wanted. There were 600 sisters 
at the peak of the order. No longer connected as a canonical institute to Rome. I think for the Immaculate Heart community, uh, we, um, we had taken a bold step, and that seems like a really feminist thing to do. We weren't bowing to male hierarchical dominance. We were standing up against it. Then what happened is, as Pat became more and more a feminist, she educated the community. feminist spirituality program at a time when this scholarship was just budding, it was just beginning. When Pat first founded the program on feminist spirituality, um, the question was, why spirituality, why not theology? And it became clear that she wanted the program on feminist spirituality because she wanted something that could apply to anybody. She had wide content with theologians and philosophers, so she was able to staff the program with eminent scholars throughout those years. It was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. She set it up on the weekends. Um, she brought in feminist theologians who could address those particular Topic. So it didn't matter whether it was economics or immigration or mental illness or addictions or violence against women. She, you know, she was she wasn't afraid of any of that stuff. Her early understanding of the importance of religion as part of feminist studies in, uh, of of religion as part of feminist studies in general, uh, what's now sometimes called gender studies. But she really understood that religion couldn't be left out of that, and that to leave it out was to leave out a real factor, kind of an engine, if you will, for discrimination and for oppression that could in fact be turned around, as the great theologian Dan McGuire says, with its renewable moral energy. In 1975, Anne McGruden Bennett was giving a talk at Claremont. And I think it was like, it, to put it in one word, Anne shone a light on the meaning of patriarchy, that Pat hadn't been really that conversant with it. And all of a sudden, she saw how the patriarchal structures that exist in every country and in the world had been responsible for poverty, you know, for people's disempowerment, for the, you know, degrading of the environment. And it's like that, it just clicked. It's like, before that, she could see all these things, but didn't get what was responsible for them. And so she talks, and she says, I was born again at that moment. I was arrested with her. We were part of a group called U.S. Out of El Salvador, and we did a um, resistance, uh, civil disobedience downtown in front of the federal building. Yes, right here in Los Angeles. So there were, must have been about 60 or 70, maybe 80 of us. And um, when you go to jail like that, you're all put in the same room. And so you really get to know people, waiting to see what's going to happen. Pat says, as we're walking outside after that little jury trial, she said, so, how do you feel about being guilty? And so people are saying, well, you know, I don't feel guilty, and blah, blah, blah. And she uh, engaged us in a little conversation about that. And she said, well, you know, there's alternative language for that, don't you? And I was like, 
what do you mean? And she said, some people would call it being faithful. I do. Pat had a phenomenal ability to put her feet where her, her theology was. You know, and it was always about women and, and helping women enhance the quality of their lives. And that was a spiritual quest for her. When she suddenly got ill, she was also in Claremont and was even closer and there was more chance to speak with her. And it went really fast. And so when she died, all of us had this powerful feeling that her presence needed to continue. The IHM women that I, that I coordinate this lecture series with have been wonderful to know. And um, just knowing more about Pat Reef, the more I know about her, the more I'm just enamored of who she was a, 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 as a person, as an activist. Um, because she took chances and she took risks. I think having it connected to a, a place of higher learning, and certainly Claremont and CGU have an excellent reputation, uh, I think keeping it anchored in this kind of a context is really critical. It is an academic program, and I think that gives it not only credibility, but it also um, ensures uh, it's success and that it will continue on for, uh, I hope, a long, long time. How do we honor Patrick's legacy? So the way for us to do that, again, is to think hard on what was important to her, to bring forward issues in social activism, social justice, uh, to think about issues uh, around women's spirituality, about um, sometimes resistance to women's movements, um, women's activism, women's spirituality even, uh, and to see how these issues are still active in life right now in the world. So this is very much what we try to do in WSR as a program, and the lecture itself is a, is a way to kind of to, to bring that moment into focus for an audience that's free, it's open to the public, bring everybody in from all kinds of places to listen to a speaker who honors this legacy of Pat Reef. Following the completion of her dissertation, Dr. Kwok taught at the Auburn Theological Seminary and then the Episcopal Divinity School in Massachusetts, where she was from 1992 until the closing of the school in 2017. At EDS, she was at the time of her departure the William F. Cole Professor of Christian Theology and Spirituality, and she is now the Distinguished Visiting Professor of Theology at Candler School of Theology at Emory University. Dr. Kwok has received a number of honors which show extraordinary excellence across all the dimensions of our works as, work as academics. She's received awards for her teaching from the American Academy of Religion in 2009, for her research from the University of Mainz, Germany in 2015, and for her mentoring from the Forum for Theological Exploration and Mentoring Consortium 
in 2016. I cannot emphasize enough how unusual this is to find someone who has received accolades for these very different skills and accomplishments. She's also been recognized by the Kampen Theological University in the Netherlands and the University of Uppsala in Sweden, both of which have given her honorary doctorates in 2004 and 2011, respectively. But perhaps the most stellar of Dr. Fox's many accomplishments, however, has been her election to the presidency of the American Academy of Religion in 2011. The largest professional society dedicated to the academic study of religion, the AAR has over 10,000 members uh, worldwide. And I'm actually going to read you a portion of Puilang's uh, blog from 2011 where she discusses her decision to run. It's all right to read your blog here. <laughs> I decided to run for the AAR presidency because I wanted to stand up for others. Even when I was a doctoral student, I was frequently invited to speak in meetings in churches and academia. I would be the lone Asian woman speaking on a panel. I generally preferred to stand up when speaking so that the audience could see me. Very often after my speech, there would be a soft-spoken, timid Asian female student who would come up to tell me that she was glad to see me standing and speaking. In the 1980s, an Asian feminist theologian was a rare sight. So I, when, when I received the call, I remember these Asian women students who once told me they were proud to see an Asian woman standing. When I said yes, I was answering to a larger call in life. In a Wabash workshop for pre-tenured Asian and Asian American faculty, I said that as leaders, we have to bring the tribe along. Those of us who are pioneers have the responsibility of opening the door a little wider for those to come. Dr. Fox's work meets at the intersection between feminist theology and post-colonial theory, or maybe I should say, places these two rather different fields into a meaningful and necessary relationship. In order to evoke a feminist, post-colonial, post-colonialist imagination. And I think you will see why we were so keen to have her here with us tonight, since she represents not only the finest feminist scholarship, but she is also an activist, with an activist spirit and a deep civic responsibility. The author of numerous publications, over 20 books in Chinese and English, I will mention just a few here that we have available for purchase in the lobby, so to give you a good sense of where and how she's been influential in our field. Uh, Globalization, Gender, and Peacebuilding, with Paulus Press. Occupy Religion, the Roman and Littlefield. Postcolonial Imagination and Feminist Theology, we have here for sale. You can get and sign a copy tonight. And Hope Abundant, Third World and Indigenous Women's Theology. We also have copies of that one available here. I imagine had Pat Reed been here today, she would have been absolutely thrilled to have found another sister in spirit, a fellow Christian, activist, feminist, theologian, working to make this corner of the academy a deeper, kinder, and more thoughtful place. So please join me in offering a very warm welcome to Dr. Kwok Puilan. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nancy Lewis, for your very generous introduction. I am deeply honored uh, to be invited to deliver this year's Pat Reed Memorial Lecture. I have not had the pleasure of meeting Pat Reed myself, but uh, yesterday and today I had dinners with uh, some of uh, her students and colleagues. And I learned that she was a scholar, a teacher, an activist, and an organizer. So she was quite a challenging teacher, pushing her students to think critically. And they were also very inspired by her passion for justice. But most of all, I liked that her relentless, her relentless pursuit for dignity and equality of women and men, and for those who are marginalized. So certainly, I find her a kindred spirit. I was the co-editor of the Journal of Feminist Studies in Religion from 2000 
uh, to 2005. When Pat Reed passed away in 2004, we dedicated a particular issue in her honor. So although I did not know her, I know that many people in the editorial board knew her and were inspired by her work and her ministry. So I feel deeply honored by the committee who had done marvelous work. I feel very much welcome, and I especially want to greet old friends, colleagues, former students sitting in our midst. And I hope by the evening's end, I will get to know more friends and colleagues. To honor her legacy, I had chosen to speak about metaphor, moral reasoning, and women's protest movements. And I hope uh, you will have many questions after the talk, uh, so that you will have ample opportunities of exchanging ideas and sharing strategies for change. So on October 21st, 2017, I participated in the Women's March in Boston. Amid a huge crowd, we didn't expect such a turnout, 175,000 strong. Some of the female marchers wore pink hats, waved homemade signs and chanted, Women united can never be defeated, as they hit the streets of Boston to protest the election of Donald Trump and to express solidarity with our society's marginalized people. Across the United States, here you can see in Washington, D.C., women and men, both young and old, took part in similar marches. How many of you participated in last year and this year's Women's March? So as you can see, quite a number here too. Now what began as a Facebook post by a Hawaiian grandmother named Teresa Sok blossomed into a worldwide protest that drew a total of 2.6 million people. The Women's March followed a very long history of women's protests and reforms in the United States. Traceable from their abolitionist movement, the Temperance Crusade, and the suffrage movement in the 19th century, to the second wave feminist movement beginning in the 60s. In the lecture tonight, I explore three metaphors that emerged from American women's protest movements, metaphors which had global impacts and ramifications. My interest in metaphors in political speech and rhetoric is inspired by the work of cognitive linguist George Leckhoff, who teaches in UC Berkeley. He co-authored this book, Metaphors We Live By, with Mark Johnson. The book has changed our understanding of metaphor and its role in language and the mind. The authors explain, and I quote, our ordinary conceptual system, in terms of which we both think and act, is fundamentally metaphorical in nature. Our concept structures that we perceive, how we get around in the world, and how we relate to other people. Metaphors structure our basic understandings of our experience and shape our perceptions and actions, often without our noticing or paying attention to them. The two authors offered several examples, as, such as time is money, love is a journey, and problems are puzzles that shape our language and thoughts in our daily lives. Lipkov applies the understanding of metaphor in his study of political division, bitterness, and acrimony in American politics. He observes that the liberals and the conservatives have different moral systems that are constructed using conceptual metaphors and categories. He writes, a conceptual metaphor 
is a conventional way of conceptualizing one domain of experience in terms of another, often unconsciously. Both conservatives and liberals, he says, use the metaphor of family when they talk about morality and politics, but they have two different emphases. The conservatives used a strict father model, while you might guess the liberals used what? Nurturing talent, a little bit more inclusive. <laughs> so these two models give rise to divergent modes of moral reasoning, as well as different opinions about the role of government, social welfare, crime, gun control, abortion, and other issues. Prompted by his study, I would like to investigate the moral reasoning behind women's protests in different historical periods in the United States by looking at the main metaphors deployed. The first one, in the 19th century. Can you guess what the metaphor would be? See if you guess it correctly. The world, our household. In the 19th century, American women who participated in social reforms and protests had to justify their right as women to work for reform in the public sphere. You will call that the traditional understanding of women's primary roles, cast them as simply wives and mothers, and limited women's activities to the home. To mobilize women to step outside the home and participate in reform movements, and especially to demand women's rights and suffrage, female reform leaders had to challenge traditional understanding of true womanhood, characterized by piety, purity, submission, and domesticity. This metaphor, the world our household, allowed women to both affirm their domestic roles, still household, but to expand their influences into the public sphere. The household is not limited to the family, but now expanding to the world. The metaphor saw the nation as family and the protection of the home as woman's prerogatives. In the 1870s, Thousands of American women participated in the temperance movement by holding prayer meetings in salons and in the streets, confronting liquor dealers and picketing <coughs> drinking establishments, and applying social pressure on community members at mass temperance meetings. They <coughs> argued that alcoholism destroyed the sanity purity, and harmony of the family. The reformers believe that they, they was a proper space and a duty for women and sought to enlarge that space by bringing the womenly role of housekeeping and children to bear on all institutions. One of the models of the Women's Christian Temperance Union WCTU is organized motherly love. <laughs> the reformers believed that women were the angels in the home, and they were ordained by God to elevate society according to the values of the home. Bearing white ribbons, these women crusaders, who were mostly middle class and married women, went into the community as guardians of public morality to save husbands and sons from the curse of drink and moral depravity. Influenced by evangelical Christianity, these women performed their work of soul saving and conversion with religious zeal. The temperance movement was strongest in the cities in the mid-Atlantic and mid-Western regions. Places where Charles Finley and the revival movement have been most influential. 
Women proclaimed that they were taking up the cross for Christ when they organized prayer meetings in the streets and confronted power owners. Francis Willard, a leader of the movement, wrote to help forward the coming of Christ into all departments of life is in his last analysis the purpose and aim of the WCPU. For women to extend their housekeeping duties beyond their domestic sphere into the public, protesters and social reformers had to reinterpret biblical teachings that had previously brought women from doing so. Some of them, including a few male supporters, began to question passages in the Bible that condone female subordination, such as in 1 Corinthians and also in Timothy. Instead, they emphasized texts speaking of how God created men and women, and how both sons and daughters will prophesy, and that God will pour the Spirit into both men and women in Acts of the Apostles. And of course, Paul's message that there is neither male and female, for all are one in Christ. Frances Willis cited this Galatian passage as support for her argument that in a Christian home, husband and wife should be equal and peers in dignity and power. While some radical women's rights activists at that time, such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton, would ground their arguments on natural rights philosophy, Francis Willard and the temperance leaders based their protest on Christian beliefs. Prompted for by evangelical civil, American Christian women saw their housekeeping roles as not limited to the nation, but extending to the whole world. They donated funds and organized women's missionary societies, sending an increasing number of female missionaries to foreign lands by the late 19th century. Conversion of heathen mothers were commonly held as a key to Christianizing the heathen nation. Missionaries introduced Western ideas about marriage, family, parenting, and hygiene to heathen mothers, and initiated social reforms against practices such as foot binding, polygamy, and promoting instead things like female literacy and health care. The WCPU became an international organization with many branches in different parts of the world, even in China. While some of these reforms have contributed to the emancipation of women, this superimposition of Western values on family and womanhood, in many cases, also reinforced cultural superiority and imperialism. The metaphor, the world, our household, succeeded in rallying several hundred thousand American women behind a movement of reform and protest based on the notions of evangelical domesticity. By the late 1880s, the WCPU has grown to be the largest women's organization in the United States. It went beyond its original focus on temperance to include causes such as women's suffrage, prison reform, conditions of working women, peace and arbitration, and health care reform. The reform movement had a very strong patriotic filter, as can be seen in the model for God and home and native land. Many American Christian women, including Frances Willard, believed that the U.S. represented the best hope for a true democratic society based on Christian values. 
and that the U.S. was to be the shining example for all other nations. Their understanding of the family and of motherhood was based also on heterosexist principles. Andrew Smith argued that the building blocks of the nation states have been the heteropatriarchal family. This is not only patriarchal, it is heteropatriarchal as well, and the genocide of native peoples. The metaphor, the world our house for, was also premised on white middle class, racial, and class biases. The construction of the public and the private, and the belief in women as angels of the home, would only work when women could depend on their husbands financially and stayed home. Many black women, however, during that time, worked in white homes as domestics. And the private sphere of white women was their corporate workplace. Poor women could not afford to stay at home, and they increasingly joined the industrial labor force in the late 19th century America. During the Jim Crow era, many white women, especially women in the American South and Midwest, supported racial segregation policies in the name of protecting their children and household. To protect racial purity, they did not support interracial marriage. And in 1950s, during the massive effort to desegregate public schools, many white women organized rallies and protests in support of segregation. And here you can see two pictures. One in 1950s in Baltimore, white women protesting school integration. The one below you have mothers protesting housing in South Boston in the 70s. So they organized campaigns, they wrote letters to the newspapers, they lobbied state and local officials, and distributed pamphlets and surveys to fight against school desegregation. The rhetoric of protecting the home and the anti-integration arguments employed by white women at this time had deep roots in the South, but also across the nation. As Elizabeth Gillipsy McRae observes, and I quote, white women took central roles in disciplining their communities according to Jim Crow's rules and were central to massive resistance to racial equality. They also provided a political education that mobilized generations and trained activists to fight for fa white family values and supremacist politics. The moral reasoning behind the metaphor of nation as family continues to have strong influence in American politics in our present era. In the 1970s, you recall the conservative icon Phyllis Schaffer used rhetoric of protecting traditional gender roles and saving the endangered family to unite and mobilize the women to join pro-life and pro-family rallies against the Equal Rights Amendments. The Christian right, especially James Dawson's focus on the family, has championed family values to show up moral authority and uphold conservative standards and behavior. They have fought against emancipation of women. They also pushed back against the feminist movement. After the defeat of Hillary Clinton in 2016, some commentators pointed to the strength of this anti-feminist movement. You may recall that 52% of white women voted for Donald Trump, mm -hmm. while the majority of women of color voted for Clinton. 
So Kim Phyllis Fan argues that there were in fact two women's movement in the United States. One does not change or challenge male authority in the family and home, but focus on gaining greater economic and political power for women. This is for women's upward mobility. While the other movement represents the more radical edge, focusing on women's consciousness raising, gender equality, reproductive freedom, and LGBTQ freedom. I now turn to this latter women's movement, often called the second wave women's movement, that attracted women not only in the United States, but worldwide. So, the second matter. Can you guess what? Many of you are familiar with this book. This one. Our bodies, ourselves. <laughs> My friend said, yes! <laughs> in the 60s, as women marched on the streets to support the civil rights movement and protested the civil war, they became even more critical they are aware of gender discrimination. Women resisted traditional gender <coughs> roles. So in the new slogan, our bodies, ourselves, emerged, which shaped women's perception of themselves, their sexuality, and their struggle for freedom. I take this slogan as a conceptual metaphor. Why? Because women's body is used metaphorically to speak about women's subjectivity and women's self worth The slogan was based on this book, Our Bodies, Ourselves, published first in 1971, translated, believe it or not, into 30 different languages, with millions of copies sold, not only here, worldwide. Now, the ability of women to make choices and decisions about their bodies became a defining issue of the second wave feminist movement. Unlike the world, our household, this slogan, our body, ourselves, did not praise women's responsibility in a family context. It rejected marriage and procreation as women's destiny and aims to empower women to take control of their bodies, sexualities, and reproduction, to fight society pressure that limits women's freedom. The authors are collective of this poem. Noted that until very recently, pregnancy were all but inevitable, and biology was our destiny. Because our bodies are designed to get pregnant and to give birth, and the hate, that is what most or all women have been doing. With the introduction of the pill, women are rid of the fear of pregnancy and can delay motherhood while they establish their careers. The Supreme Court's landmark decision, Roe v. Wade, gave women the right to make decisions about abortion. Abortion offers women choices about whether to have children and when to have them. Proponents of our bodies ourselves argued that women can take charge of our own bodies because we are moral agents and we should not be treated as children. We do not need to defer to the priest, to the fathers, to the doctors, or to whoever else. We should be the one making those moral decisions. So second wave feminism asserted women's rights to protect their bodily integrity and boundaries. Thus, the feminist movement fought against rape, domestic violence, sexual harassment, organizing campaigns such as Take Back the Night. For women's bodies to flourish, women also need to have access to education, employment, health care, and political power. Against this backdrop of the second wave feminist movement, feminist theology has contributed to the recovering of women's bodies as positive. 
Rose Redford Ruther. I was trying to find a younger picture of Rose Mary. <laughs> so uh, described how Christian theology, influenced by Greek philosophy, had polarized the mind over the body. Since women were associated with nature and physicality, they were denigrated in much of the Christian tradition. Even though women, like men, are created in the image of God, women somehow was taken to symbolize evil or uh, inferiority. Ruther proposed a positive view of women's bodies and an egalitarian relationship between women and men. And then she argues, and I quote, there has been throughout the entire history of Christianity theologies of women's original equality with men restored in Christ. The other day, I was citing uh, Dr. Buddha's book, Women and Redemption, mm -hmm. to illustrate women had a very rich tradition in Christianity as well. Yes, they were oppressive elements in the tradition, but let us not forget, they are also liberating motifs and traditions. So other radical feminist scholars, such as Mary Daly, argued in Beyond God the Father, Christianity is irredeemably sexist and cannot be reformed or rehabilitated. That is why Mary Daly became post-Christian. And then there is also Carol P. Christ, who looked beyond Christianity to rediscover the ancient goddess tradition of old Europe. Feminist rituals in the goddess movement emphasize the natural cycles of women's bodies and their alignment with cycles of nature. And debates surrounding abortion, Christian emphasis, such as Beverly Harrison, has written this very important book, Our Right to Choose. She marshaled resources from both the Bible and the Christian tradition to support women's rights to choose. The model, our bodies, ourselves, aimed to establish a moral worldview that unites women based on their shared experience of being female. But gender is only one characteristic that mark the body. Sherry, Moraka, and Gloria as a doer in the wheel in the white woman's woman by co-editing this foundational text. This came out when I was a doctoral student. This quickly became the Bible for women of color. Mm -hmm. This bridge called my bed. Later editions came out, did not use this cover, unfortunately. I still have, have this edition. <laughs> Using poetry, interviews, personal essays, testimonials. This anthology explores, in Moraka's own words, the complex confluence of identities, race, class, gender, sexuality, systemic to women of color, oppression, and liberation. In Christian theology, womanist, Buharista, Asian American, and Native American scholars also began to articulate theology based on the intersections of multiple identities and oppression. When I edited the book, Hope Abundant, I was very sure that I needed to include third world women's voices. But then, for a long time, we didn't pay so much attention to indigenous and native women's voices, which of course would not be acceptable in our age. And that is why I put them together, third world and indigenous or native women's voices in hope abundance. In this very important essay, The Color of Feminism, or Speaking the Black Woman's Tongue, women's theologian Delores Williams challenges racism, suffrage movement, and the second wave, white feminist movement. She pointed out that the understanding of patriarchy in white feminist theology is insufficient 
or even biased, harmful, she said, while white feminists criticized patriarchy. They also benefit from the white-controlled American institutions. The police, the educational system, the employment system, the welfare system. They may not be asking white women those questions when they ask black or women of color those questions. I probably remembered a story that I heard from my colleague, an African-American woman professor. Because we were talking about the practice of the police stopping black people, I asked her, did it ever happen to you? She said, it did, sometimes frequently. Now, I have never had that experience because I do not drive. <laughs> but if I do drive, I don't think with this color, this gender, the police would just stop me randomly. When the police stop me, there might be for one reason that I might have lost my way and he or she will be helping me. So, as you can see there, women of different colors occupy different positions in society. Patriarchy worked differently. So the white institutions provide resources for white women's upward mobile uh, um, journey, but may not provide the same opportunities for women of color. By pointing their fingers at men, some of the white feminists do not account for the horizontal violence of white women against other women, whether consciously or unconsciously. As the body became the site of contestation in cultural criticism, post-structuralist theory and queer theory, the metaphor, our body, ourselves, have been subjected to further scrutiny. Queer theorist Judith Buckman of the University of California, Berkeley, contests the binary construction of gender. Only two genders, <coughs> male, female, <coughs> men and women, nothing in between. Gender, of course, is a continuum, not a binary. So in this book, Bodies That Matters, she further challenges how heterosexual hegemony and regulatory norms of sex constitute the materiality of gender, sexuality, and sexual difference. She points out the exclusionary practices of heterosexism, which allow certain subjects to be formed, while simultaneously producing other abject subjects who are relegated to the unlivable or uninhabitable realm. In other words, Judith Butler asks us to rethink how the boundaries between our bodies and their bodies have been constituted, demarcated, and maintained. There is a movement in my school to uh, have a transgender uh, bathroom. The question is, where is this to be located? Those who are uh, in the first floor with the officers said, well, it might be good for the fourth floor to have that. <laughs> the fourth floor people said, oh, it might be second floor, maybe more convenient. You know what I mean. <laughs> Bowler's challenge was taken up by queer theologians such as Marcella Alfiers with Invested Memory, who spoke in decent theology, questions deep-seated heterosexist ideologies in Christian theology. <laughs> she argues that all theologies are sexual. Well, I think those two sexual theologies, their theology is sexual. She said no. <clears throat> Implicitly or explicitly, it has the sexual dimension. <laughs> and also, theologies either conform to decent heterosexual norms or opt for indecent and queer perversions of heteropatriarchy. After Hillary Clinton, lost the election. Many of us asked what would it mean for the feminist movement and its future 
after the first female candidate of a major political party lost, while for a billion years with a record of both admitted and alleged harassment, misogyny, and insults toward women won. In case you are thinking, this may be a good article to read. Columbia University's Mark Lelis published a widely read essay, The End of Identity Liberalism. He has expanded this into a book. And he said, well, the liberal movement too often focused on identity politics and diversity issues, such as race, gender, and sexuality. For him, such a focus can be divisive rather than unifying. And the democratic process needs principles to unify people. He argues that instead of focusing on identity politics, we should engage more in the conversations about class, war, political economy, and the common good. There were more than a thousand comments after this was published within a short period of time. Some argued what he called identity politics, politics, politics are really strategies to address real problems of racial and gender discrimination. So they disagree with him. But I myself think he has a point in that the feminist movement has focused overwhelmingly on gender, race, and sexuality but not enough on the issues of class, poverty, and working people's rights in a society divided by a widening gap between the rich and the poor. No wonder white working men, they voted for, for, for Trump overwhelmingly. Some women in the global south do not want to be associated with this term, feminism because it is often taken to mean simply women's fight for sexual freedom. This may be a biased view, but this was quite frequently accepted. For feminism to have a future, the bodies that matter must include the bodies of gender subordinates who are relegated to the margins of society. I am talking about those people who inhabit all the land and who do not benefit from the neoliberal economy. The American feminist movement must broaden its concerns and work in solidarity with women in other parts of the world who toil under military regimes, war and violence, migration, gender violence of all kinds. So I come to our contemporary <coughs> the last, third metaphor. It is this one. Why our politics are aware? It is because I am increasingly paying attention to how social media and information technology has changed contemporary social protests and reform movements, as we have seen in the Arab Spring and Occupy movement in 2011 to 2012. While doing research for the whole occupied religion, I had the opportunity of visiting different campsites. And then I saw how they organized the General Assembly. Why? Talking about radical democracy, it took a long time to decide how to use $250. <laughs> but the most intriguing thing was they live stream what they were doing. There was a university, do you know that? Organized in the, the sites in Boston. And there was even a library. So they um, live streamed some of those speeches and wow, this was really exciting for me to watch what the younger people were trying to do. Social so media is more than networking websites, Facebook or Twitter. It includes a very broad and growing portion of the internet that is designed as platforms to allow users or group of users to create content and to exchange ideas with one another. In the book, 
treating to power, the social media revolution in American politics. Jason Gennius and Helen Wagner describe how the nature of the political world and of people's political participation has changed because of social media and other information technology. Some of us may not be aware that it's all, not only the younger generation using uh, social media and obviously people of different generations are using it. When I travel in more uh, underprivileged countries, I was surprised to see mobile phones being so popular, talking about in Africa, for example. Why? They bypass the landmines, so they directly went to this mobile uh, information uh, technology. So then, the use of social media and the web changed the way we organized protest <coughs> movements. Let us look at the Women's March again. It all began with a simple post on Facebook. So Teresa Sok of Hawaii created a Facebook event and invited friends to march in protest in Washington, D.C. Soon, other women from in other cities created similar events. And from such a grassroots effort, a national coordinating structure was formed. Learning from past mistakes, they invited also women of color to participate in the team of leaders. Outside the United States, there were also groups formed <coughs> to coordinate the Women's March. <coughs> so you have one in London, another one in Oxford. Down below, you have Women's March in Buenos Aires and also in Korea. They organized their marches also using social media and protest strategies using Skype. The Women's March was covered by national and local media, and the Washington March was live streamed on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. I was not in Washington, but I watched some of the speeches through the live stream. Now, I got the message that there was going to be a Women's March in Boston from the internet. So the day I took the bus to go to uh, downtown Boston to participate in the march, I told my friends, I am now taking the bus to go to the march. They said they are going to later during the day in their different cities. Now I am in Boston, and in case those who are familiar, I took some pictures stepping on the stairs of the cathedral. And then after that, I posted the Boston March, uh, Boston, uh, Boston Common. My friends like my post. <laughs> they post the pictures too. Yeah. <laughs> the Women's March demonstrated how our politics are well functions and how social media has changed political mobilization and communication. Using social networks, women can initiate social protests and movements to find like-minded people. Social media enables women to connect with one another and in other parts of the world instantly. Can you believe it? In 2010, fully 22% of American internet users use social media websites for political activities. And this percentage is likely to increase as more and more people use social media through mobile devices. People are increasingly accessing their news through social media. They are more likely to participate in an event if their friends said they are going to. The web has drawn more women into the political process through their social networking, tweeting, blogging, posting on websites, responding to posts, and creating news accounts. You can see from this slide, women used social media, in many cases, 
บแต่แม่ There are many examples of how we have used social media for social activism in recent years. For example, women in Texas protested an abortion bill in 2013 by posting online with the hashtag stands with Wendy, supporting state representative Wendy Davis through her 13-hour filibuster. In 2015, women call out sexism in Super Bowl advertisements in real time using the hashtag not buying it. The top trending hashtag on Twitter about feminism in 2015 was bring back our girls, which protested the kidnapping of 200 girls in Nigeria. Some may question whether this so-called hashtag activism and cyber feminism can bring any real changes. Certainly, this is a very good question. But these political activities on social networks have created social awareness, and in some cases, succeeded in bringing politicians, agencies, and even companies to change their policies and behavior. The most obvious example, obviously, is the Me Too movement, which was started in October 2017 to protest sexual harassment and assault following the sexual misconduct allegations against Harvey Weinstein. Millions of women have used this hashtag to share their stories and experiences about sexual harassment and abuse, to show the pervasive nature of misogynistic behavior. The willingness of so many women to come forward to share their stories created an atmosphere that makes more women feel comfortable to admit that they too have been victims of sexual abuse. Many of us might have watched the testimony of Dr. Fong when she testified against Judge Kavanaugh. The power of the web and social media had attracted the attention of feminist scholars in religion. Gina Messina Dyson, in her TED Talk, said, Technological spaces have become a space for us that has not existed in the past. And social media has propelled forward the online feminist movement. In fact, feminist blogs have been called the consciousness raising group of the 21st century. Many of us sat in our living room or church basement and participating in consciousness raising. That was a time when we talk about the personal is indeed political. Remember those days? Today, we have another value. Websites, families blogs, Facebook posts. So, she argued that these technological changes has created a so-called, she called it, new feminist revolution in religion. Because the digital world offers women a voice as a Catholic. She knows that traditional leadership has been dominated by men and women's participation has been suppressed. But now, women can share religious ideas and form communities freely on the web, reaching across social and geographical boundaries. In the groundbreaking book, Feminism and Religion in the 21st Century, Subtitled Technology Dialogue and Expanding Borders, co edited by Gina and Rose Mary. Uh, the contributors explore many issues that are related to women, religion, and activism. Women's scholar Monitor Coleman explains how blocking can be used for feminist religious activism to reach across boundaries. Through blocking, she can discuss practices of the church that are discriminatory and explore issues such as depression 
and miscarriage. Issues that might be not often discussed in the church. Not only that, what about women in the Mormon church? As we know that, the Mormon church does not obey women or respect women's leadership. However, in 2013, there was an online movement or petition for ordination of women in the Mormon church. And more than 700 people signed the uh, pledge. We also have Muslim women using the web. As we know that some of the Muslim women are not proficient in Arabic, and they are not allowed to share the same space with unrelated men in study or prayer. And so now they can access some of those knowledge uh, about the Quran and about their tradition through reading blogs and through social platforms. <coughs> social media enabled feminist scholars, especially women of color, to intervene and to disrupt white mainstream and male perspective on religion. A friend of mine, Grace Key, used this social media, podcast, and YouTube videos for her activism. She explains why she's doing this, and I quote. We do not have diverse voices in the mainstream religion, politics, and society. We must have diverse voices. We need to hear voices, especially from women of color and Asian American women. Social media provides such a platform for various voices to be heard. And it is good that I can share my voice through such an open platform. This is from her article in this book, Theologians and Philosophers Using Social Media. Advice, tips, and testimonials. So you might want to look at uh, this book to um, see who else have contributed. The web allows feminist scholars and religious leaders to reach beyond their class roles and religious communities to generate interest and mobilize people to pay attention to particular issues. A friend of mine who teach in Chicago, Leah Swartz, is a professor in science and religion. She created a blog or website to explore the theology of uh, urban nature. And she said, using the blog, she wants to create an experience for her readers about nature and about a nature's rela relationship to urban planning. I have my blog too. So I was in Africa, in South Africa, Peter Marisburg, <coughs> attending a conference with this three themes, religion, gender, and sexuality. Oh, it really blew my mind. Because we had six plenaries, more than 50 papers. Can you believe it? I even heard about GLBT movement in the charismatic movement in Africa. I have never heard about that, you know? <laughs> and so, I wrote this book and telling my readers and what I have learned. So, I come to my conclusion. Each of the three metaphors generated a moral well-being and enabled women to reflect on their identity and social position and to take action and push for social change. The metaphor, the world our household, did not refute feminine domesticity, but extended motherly love and care to the public way. In contrast, the metaphor, our bodies ourselves, <coughs> challenged biology as destiny and focused on women's autonomy and control of their sexuality and reproduction. The metaphor, our politics, our web, points to a moral will, will that recognizes the intersectionality of social oppression and the need to build coalition. But each metaphor is not without challenges. In the case of the world, our household, the household has been modeled mostly after white heterosexual middle class family. The metaphor, our bodies, ourselves, has been used 
who refer mainly to white, heterosexual female bodies. Women of color did not find their interest represented by the white feminist movement, and they need to organize resistance movements of their own. This contemporary metaphor, our politics, our webs, privileges those who have access to the internet. Yes, our women colleagues in poorer countries, they may have mobile phones, but sometimes broadband is a problem, isn't it? <coughs> so there is also the divide between those who are very fluent in the language of social media and those who are not or not yet. My study also shows that a metaphor such as the world, our household, can galvanize women in one era for social reform, but it can become reactionary or even conservative in a later era. What about religion? Religion serves as an important factor in the conceptualization, <coughs> debate, and support of these metaphors. In the 19th century, as I said, female reformers drew from evangelical domesticity in arguing for with the world, our household. The second wave women's movement and liberal feminist movement theology reinforced each other. Today, as the conservative religious voices dominate the media, the web becomes a critical space for progressive female and feminist voices to be heard. As religion continues to be an important force in social life, women's protest will not be effective without mobilization of religious communities. Tonight, we honor a very important activist, organizer, scholar, who have laid down an example and foundation for us. And I hope we will build on that inspiring and wonderful legacy. Thank you very much. institutions, as the Lord William said. Those institutions may offer protection, if not resources, for white people. Mm -hmm. Yes, the one at the back. So you said that uh, women of color are not finding their interests um, met <laughs> within the white feminist spaces, and I totally agree with that. I'm Palestinian, born in Baghdad, Iraq. I have not found yeah. my interests met um, in any white spaces, uh, very rarely. 
Um, I'm a seminary dropout from 19 years ago, and I just wonder. So, if we're not if we're not going to find um, our interests met in those spaces, where are you finding uh, interests of women of color uh, and, that are interested also in religious um, metaphors? The ideas that you spoke of tonight. Where are we finding? Like, where can I go? <laughs> where are my people? <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, one of my way of um, surviving the white academia, if not the white church, is to create your own network, to create your own spaces. When I was a doctoral student new to the country, and so together with other doctoral students and the students, studying in different divinity schools and seminaries in the Northeast. We organized this group that was called Asian Women Theologians. That was in 1984. When we started that, it was a woman's uh, doctoral students, uh, master students network. I could not believe that we survived. And then the 34th uh, conference will take place next year in Atlanta. And I, together with my colleagues in Atlanta, will be organizing that. We recognize Palestine as Western Asia, not Middle East. Yes. So come Swan. and join us. We even provide scholarship. Please spread the word. So this is one of um, um, an, an example but throughout my career that I have formed or been part of different groups. We cannot struggle alone, isn't it? And we need other people because we have multiple talents. And that is why I continue to form those groups. Some of you know that, uh, together with other colleagues, I co-edited the book, Teaching Global Theologies. How did it come about? It came about because three of us were in the same place giving lectures or talking to students. One, a white man, another, a black man and me. So we were in the taxi, <laughs> and then driving somewhere. Three of us said we had to do a project together. We invited our friends, and so we had a project. We published teaching global theologies. Mm -hmm. For me, scholarship is never done alone. Brilliant as we are, we need <laughs> other voices. <laughs> Thank you for your question. <laughs> yes, Gail. Uh, you know, I really appreciate the, um, the, the one on our politics our, and, and our web, um, but I'm just getting so disillusioned using the web because we have Russian uh, uh, interference and the fake news, and I'm just wondering how you would deal with, with the, well, first of all, the explosion of what you can read, and the discernment to go and distinguish in what would be profitable and uh, fruitful for you and what is crap. Yes. Gail <laughs> <Yes. laughs> just asked a very good question. Why? Because as professors, we are increasingly facing the question. Why the students said, we learn this from the web? Then, or Google, right? there's this Googling. So how can the student or ourselves differentiate what is fake news? and what is not fake news, uh, real news. I think that is really <coughs> difficult. And certainly, to help students to develop some critical thinking, you should be critical too. Not just accepting any news or any blog post or anything we can find from the web as true. So who is the one writing it? And what are the uh, perspectives? Can we um, uh, contrast this with the other sources? Mm -hmm. And certainly, in addition to the web or the internet, they are still published works. Mm -hmm. They are still <laughs> reliable scholars <laughs> who have devoted time to gather those data and research. Yeah. So I think these days, we need multiple sources. And then we need to develop that critical thinking, not just to say yes but to pause and to think, and to develop our own critical mind as well. So I think this is very important. One thing that I am learning myself, that is, as liberals, we tend to go to those websites or news sources. 
That is why the country is so divided. Those of us who look at Huffington Post or New York Times would not be reading the Fox News or whatever, okay? or your favorite conservative commentators' blogs. And that is why we are in our own little boxes, isn't it? So I think for our own good, we need to branch out to see other perspectives as well. Otherwise, we are talking to the choir. We are already converted, we think. <laughs> But we need to know what are the metaphors for the other group. What is the moral reasoning behind somebody who would think the strict father model will work, while as nurturing parents talking about respect, inclusiveness will not work. Why somebody would be thinking about the uh, social policy or the world like that? When we do not do that, we lost, isn't it? because we fail to speak the other's language. Mm. And selling things, even selling ideas, we need to acquire more than one time, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> OK. Thank you, Dr. Poppy Lowe. We have a phenomenal talk. Can you hear me? Okay. So I also have a question about you, the, the third metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, and it's connected to the social movement you're hoping that will emerge from it. So in the first metaphor, you see temperance, mm -hmm. and you see women's missionary societies, and you can't take care of it. And in the second, you talked about reproductive justice, and mm -hmm. in the church, you talked about combating you know, sexism mm -hmm. or patriarchal structures. So what, what's your hope for what emerges in the moment we're on? We are in today, right, with the West. So you gave some semblances of Me Too or whatever. But what are you hoping for in terms of the social vision or concrete social policy? Thank you very much. I think that we have yet to see what will be emerging. Why? Because the younger generation, they are much more creative than my generation in terms of using <coughs> social media. That is why observing how they organize. Uh, during the Occupy movement was so eye-opening for myself. Mm -hmm. That is just to see how, how they do this so-called radical democracy. How do they do that? How they would have um, so many people participating and uh, instantly that they can call a group or whatever uh, to do a protest. That was really um, uh, inspiring for me. But certainly I have several hopes, as I uh, mentioned a little bit. One, intersectionality. The Women's March was not just about women. Do you notice that? It was many, many different forms of um, reforms, protests in one space. It's not just about the liberation of women or gender oppression. So intersectionality, two, transnational. I talk about not just national or geographical borders. How can we now, given the technology, be much more open to what is happening in other parts of the world. This semester, I am teaching a class that is called Critical Issues in Global Anglicanism. So then, just soon, I ask Dr. Esther Mumble from Kenya to speak. Next week, I have uh, Ms. Uh, Daniela Genrich coming from a South African background, Zoom in to talk about the use of inclusive liturgy in that part of the world. We need to have this kind of consciousness, both in the classroom and also in our organizing, transnational. And then the third, I think people of my generation need to learn, not learn less, learn more, to catch up, isn't it? <laughs> when I talk about this, I have people of older generation coming up to tell me, well, I start needs to learn more about social media. Or a professor telling me last night, when the students were all doing this, I shouldn't think that it's all bad. They may be doing something good. And I said, maybe. <laughs> I want 
to go back to the American black expression of feminism today and ask you what's the level of interest or research awareness on the womanist? What is the level of interest? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Thank you very much. And uh, certainly, uh, I would uh, like uh, the womanist um, uh, scholars to speak more about that. But let me just share with you in my lifetime, okay? That is when I started Dr. Bogan in the 80s. Um, Delores Williams was also a student at Union Theological Center. And then other colleagues, just uh, like uh, Dr. Katie Jennifer Cannon in present memory, just received her doctorate a few years ahead of me. So I had the privilege of befriending all these first generation womanist uh, colleagues just because we were in uh, the doctoral programs in different schools. And very few of us uh, received the doctoral degree yet. And so at that time, uh, we had fewer voices. And then most of us could catch up with what the womanists have published. Today, this is not the case. Mm. We could hardly catch up because there are so many women scholars contributing in so many different fields. But there is one thing I regret. What is it? That is, very often, we still tend to focus on the work of some of those leading, if not pioneering, voices. And, uh, but there are new generation uh, and uh, different generation of women scholars. And I must say uh, that increasingly, many divinity schools, seminaries, are paying attention to the black voices and recognizing they are both black male voices and womanist voices as well. And I certainly hope as more work uh, has been produced and will be produced in the future, that we will pay much more attention to uh, the contribution of our womanists. Because I must say, they are the ones who first taught me, or people of my generation, that we need to use a multiple perspectives to talk about oppression, not gender alone. Gender and race and class, isn't it? Three things when I was a doctoral student. But certainly today, we would add sexuality, uh, colonization, and different religious tradition, all these different axes. But that is why it's from a black woman scholar that we learn intersectionality, mm -hmm. that term, isn't it? Yes. Last question. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So there was another speaker that scrubs College Garden, and he was an Asian American journalist who talked about how um, Asian Americans aren't always seen as people of color because we experience privileges that other uh, people of color don't, but at the same time, um, in white spaces, we don't experience all of the privileges that a white person would. So what do you think specifically Asian Americans can bring um, to conversations about intersectionality and race um, and like those intersections with feminism? Thank you very much. This is indeed a very important question. I'm glad this is the last uh, question to conclude uh, this uh, evening. When I first came to the United States, I did not identify myself as a woman of color. Why? Because I came from the majority Chinese of the world. 1.3 billion strong, in case you do not know. Because to me, that I am a minority, you must be out of your mind. <laughs> and in case you do not know, today, the number one language used on the internet is not English or French, or Spanish, or Chinese. <laughs> and so I can identify myself. So this is a process, isn't it? And then for Asian Americans to come together as Asian Americans was a process. <coughs> the term was constructed in, during the Civil Rights Movement, when different Asian American groups then came together to form a movement. They didn't like the term Oriental. They didn't like the term Yellow. Because not Asian, not all Asians are yellow. 
Some have much darker skin. So to call us yellow will be misrepresentation. So they coined this term Asian American. Since then, friends, we have been struggling to understand who are included in the label Asian American. Why? We have people from different religious, linguistic, cultural, geographical, national backgrounds. We do not have one common language. There is no Spanish unifying us, okay? And so, not only that, there was the hegemony of the Northeast. Those people from China, from Korea, they somehow would be the Asians when people think about who the Asians are. So you have so many differences among us. How can we come together? That is a very important question. The second question you ask, what are our significant contributions then? Given that we were sandwiched in between, isn't it? Talking about colorism that the Ross Williams talked about. Colorism is not just racism. You have the totem pole of the colors. The whiter you are, then you are in the top. And then you are darker skin, then you are there. And so when we were sandwiched in between, we are in and out of white spaces, as you just said. We are also in and out of black spaces or in and out of Latino spaces. Why in and out? Sometimes we are included because we want to have a big group, women of color. Sometimes we say, you do not speak Spanish. Sorry, you are out. Okay, can you see that? We are in and out. And because of the particular military history with the United States, the Asian nations, and then we certainly have a lot more memory of the wars, conflicts, militarism across Asia Pacific as well. And today, we are talking about affirmative action. You, some, you may have heard the case that is uh, at Harvard. And then the Asian Americans, some of them sue Harvard for the ambition policy, saying that it's not um, equal or to, uh, to, uh, they, they were discriminated against. So we occupy such difficult and multiple positions. That is indeed our strength, isn't it? That is, we do not see one issue from one homogenic point of view. Rather, there are so many perspectives. And then when you look at society through that particular lens, you see the in-betweenness. You see the hybridity. You see possibilities or rooms for dialogue that others who may not have that kind of experience may not see. And so for me, these multiple lenses, one pair of lens bombarding against the other pair of lens has been most helpful for myself in developing my own um, research and also devising strategies. You need to know more than or outside those binary regimes of truth to entertain the thought that you have both similarities and differences. While we certainly work together because of the commonalities, we have to respect the diversities and differences first <coughs> among ourselves as Asian Americans and use what we have learned from that experience to then contribute to building alliances and to have dialogue with other groups. I think it was in Atlanta, wasn't it two years ago at Atlanta? Then there was a panel that talks about dialogue across racial uh, differences. Uh, that was a time when the Black Lives Matter, that movement, was very, was very strong. And uh, the scholars were invited. And so, at the Center of Human Rights in Atlanta, Amy Towns and myself and other scholars, we talked about the issue or the racial dynamics in the United States. And we published our papers. And this is available online. There is a journal called 
Journal of Asian American Theological Educa Educators, Janati, J A N A T Z. And then, so when you go to that site, you will see the papers from that panel. And I think that it might be helpful for some of us who want to hear what some of the scholars from across the racial spectrum have to say on that uh, very issue. How, what are the contributions of, this, of different racial and ethnic groups? And how can we listen, learn from each other, and build our coalition? Thank you very much for your question.